Thank you, Ailey, for the super fast reading. <laughs> Meanwhile, uh, that I uh, couldn't help but laugh. But uh, all throughout the month of December, I'm going to preach on the miracles of Jesus' birth. Um, there are a lot of miracles surrounding the birth of Jesus Christ himself. And all throughout this month, we're going to learn about five specific miracles that happened right around during and after the birth of Jesus Christ. And the first one is the birth of John the Baptist, or actually, literally, it's John the Baptizer. And so um, I had you guys read the whole, almost the whole chapter, because I wanted you guys to get a good idea of what was taking place. And um, it's very important to Luke, who wrote the book of Luke. So uh, I wanted you guys to understand the scenario that was happening. So Zechariah is a, a priest in the lineage of Aaron. And so uh, for the Jewish people, back when they uh, were the Israelites, ever since the inception, uh, their religious and their political uh, authority was one. So they were not separated by politicians and government and um, a military order like America is now. Their religious leader is the military leader, is the leader, period. And so uh, God had chosen the brother of Moses, Aaron, to be the lineage of the priest. He was a Levite, and the peop only people that were born of Aaron in the line of Aaron's family were to be priests and leaders of the people um, going forward. And they literally track this very carefully. If you research uh, Jewish, uh, Jewish history, um, one of the evidence for the, the Bible and the birth of Jesus is because Zechariah is actually uh, listed by name. And people can actually trace over hundreds and hundreds and almost a thousand years uh, from uh, Aaron down to Zechariah. All the families, all the families that were priests and Zechariah and when it was his turn to go into the temple uh, service. And so it's an honor uh, we first we see that Zechariah was a very honored person. And what we don't know until I did the research and saw that it was a double honor because Elizabeth was also born in the family of Aaron. And so um, Levites, uh, priests, they don't have to marry a person from the Aaron lineage, but it's a double honor if they did. And Elizabeth was also born of Aaron. Uh, all the way down, almost 800, uh, 800 years later, she was also from the family of Aaron, the priesthood. And so this family, you can imagine, uh, they had a lot of honor among the people. They had a leadership position. They had authority among the people um, as a priest. But uh, they were uh, shamed. In the, um, in the last verses, this is what Elizabeth said, um, He's taken away my disgrace among the people because Zechariah and Elizabeth could not have children. And so you guys are probably, probably a little too young to know. Um, and living in this day and age, I think a lot of people don't want children at all. But back then, if you were a family and you got married, and especially among the Asian culture, if you did not have some babies pretty soon, then the mother-in-law start looking at you with a wicked eye. Um, and so it was not only a bad thing that people frown upon that you did not have children. At a certain point in your life, you were considered probably cursed because maybe you did something bad. That's why God struck you and you could not have children. Um, and so there's all kinds of people's ideas, but no matter what it was, uh, Elizabeth felt the shame. Uh, in her life, and so did Zechariah. You can imagine broken dreams. They were faithful. They kept the laws of God and the commandments of God. It says here, without blame. And so it says here that they are very faithful people, people that believed in God, people that worshiped God, people that honored God, and yet they had this um, spot, this shame upon their life, and it was something they could do nothing about. Because 
you know, when you don't have children. Back then, you just couldn't do much about it. And so they prayed, and you can imagine when they got married, they probably got married when they were like maybe 18 or 20, um, and they were imagining in their heads little uh, cute chubby babies, and, um, and then they kept praying for, you know, whatever they thought, maybe a boy and a girl, maybe two boys and a girl, and then they were like 20-something, and then 30-something, and then 40-something, and still no baby. And so you can imagine the discouragement of uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth. And so I want to tell you, um, with the coming of Jesus Christ, there were a lot of miracles. And the miracles did not stop. And so I understand that in our lives, sometimes we pray and we pray and we pray, but we are met with discouragement in our lives. We have faith in God. We're never going to leave God. We're never going to stop going to church. Um, we will not, never turn away from God, but we are so discouraged. And because of, um, uh, because of the wearing down of our faith, we have stopped believing in who God really is as a God of miracles, as a powerful God that is not subject to nature. Um, and so this morning, I want you to understand with the birth of Jesus Christ, there began many miracles. And I want you to think of it in terms of mathematics. And I know you don't have to do the complex calculus math, but imagine if you were to count up all the miracles in the Old Testament, all the times that God did a miracle, great big miracles parted the Red Sea. I bet you if you counted up all the miracles in all of the Old Testament, they would not even equal the miracles done by Jesus in three years. Because when you read the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, everywhere that Jesus went, almost every day, there were miracles that happened. The sick were healed. The the hip, uh, the crippled walked. The um, deaf people could hear. Miracles happened every single day, and it did not stop with Jesus Christ. In the book of Acts, after Jesus died, he rose and he uh, went back to heaven and sat at the right hand of God. It says here, and you guys read it with me in Acts 5:12. One, two, three. The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people. It says here, the apostles actually performed the signs and wonders among the people. And if you read the book of Acts, you can see that great miracles, so much so and so often that people, whenever Peter would walk somewhere, the apostle Peter would walk somewhere, people would lay the sick in his shadow. He wouldn't even touch them or even speak to them. Just in his shadow and they would be healed. Those, those kinds of signs and wonders happen. And it happened often. And it happened frequently. And it happened all the time. I think those three things say the same thing. But it happened a lot. And so I want you to understand with the coming of Jesus Christ, we live in the time that God's kingdom is manifested, displayed, showed on the face of this earth among God's people. That's the time that we live in. And that started with the coming of Jesus Christ. So even though we may be worn out, um, I encourage you <clears throat> to think, to hope, to pray for miraculous things. I think what happened here is Zachariah and Elizabeth, they stopped hoping. That's why they were so shocked when Gabriel appeared and said, you are going to have a baby. And not just any baby, you are going to have John. And John will be a great joy to you. And he's going to be great among all the people of Israel. And not any just great person of Israel. He's going to have the mind and the power of the great prophet Elijah. That great. So you can imagine Zechariah is like, no. No, no, no. And so I imagine that's what happened. So that's why Zechariah would say, how can I be sure? I'm pretty old. My wife is pretty old. We've been praying for a very long time, and it hasn't happened yet. You know, 
You can imagine all these things going on in Zechariah's head. That's because um, sometimes we live in a time where we don't expect God's miracles to happen, and it hasn't happened yet. And it's like a vicious cycle. If you don't expect it, you don't ask for it, you don't pray for it, it doesn't happen. And I say this because I experienced it myself recently. When I um, expect God to be the God that he says that he is in the Bible, and I dare pray it, then I receive the miracles uh, that God has promised. And I'm not talking about big, huge things, like I haven't cured anybody of cancer, but uh, I experience these miracles um, often in my life, in my, my own life, in my children's life. I pray for them uh, when they're sick. Uh, I lay my hands on them, and I pray for healing in the name of Jesus Christ. Um, and other things, too. I don't want to tell you because you think I'm a little weird, but I pray, and I experience God's miracles. It's because we don't, we stop believing, and then we don't ask for it, and that's why we don't receive. So that's the first thing I want you to understand. Now I'm just going to go through two miracles, and we're going to wrap it up. The first one most people don't think is the miracle. The first thing, the miraculous sign that happened was that um, Zechariah could not speak. And in the Bible, there is a lot of people that were um, mute, like they couldn't speak. And then suddenly they were healed and they could speak. There was no other person in the Bible that could normally speak. And then suddenly they couldn't speak except one person. Who knows who that is? Oh, I didn't expect. I had to Google it myself. There was only one person. His name was Daniel. And what happened was Daniel was fasting for 21 days, that's three weeks, he was praying. He loved his people. He loved the people of Israel. The same thing that I teach you guys. Love your family, love your people, love your church. And that's who Daniel was. He fasted and he prayed. He asked God, what about the future of my people? Because they were, you know, destroyed almost completely. There were very few survivors. They almost had no future. And he fasted and prayed. And then he saw a vision of God come to him. And when he saw the vision of God in the presence of God, he could not speak for about an hour. That was the only time. So the first miracle I want you to understand is in the presence of God. When the presence of God comes, there is a change in people's speech. And so I want you to understand, and this is very consistent, when Jesus Christ uh, grew up as a carpenter's son, you don't read or hear a whole lot about Jesus Christ and what he did, but when he was baptized in the River Jordan, um, and then he rose from the waters, and the Father said, this is my son whom uh, pleases me in all ways, and then the Spirit of the Holy Spirit descended on him, what happened to him? He was led into the wilderness. And have you read in the book of Mark, what was in the wilderness? The wild beasts in the wilderness. On my way to travel to California, I've never like driven that way. But if you've driven from Oklahoma to California, the stretch from Las Vegas to California is pure desert. There is like nothing out there. Not even like, not even like anything, not even an animal. I didn't see anything but just sand and sand and um mountains and nothing. So you can imagine Jesus Christ probably didn't say much in 40 days and 40 nights, except three things. And it was all spoken to Satan who came and tempted him. And Jesus didn't say a whole lot to Satan either. You know, I, um, I call a lot of elderly folks when I was in high school, I was a telemarketer. And when people are isolated, they talk a whole lot to people who call them on the phone. Like I would try to sell them things and they tell me about their flower garden and things like that because they were so lonely. Imagine Jesus Christ for 40 days and 40 nights not speaking to anybody. Satan comes and the only thing he says to Satan is a Bible verse. He said it three times, and Satan left him. And so when the presence of God comes, your speech changed. For Zechariah, when the presence of God came, when the, uh, when the word of God came to him, he was speechless. Instead of faithless words, um, those words were just immediately cut off. Words of doubt, words of uh, faithlessness, uh, words of negativity, all those things stopped when the presence of God and the will of God is manifested in his life. 
That's what I want you to understand first. Sometimes we think that the big great miracle in our life is like healing of cancer or something big and great and miraculous. But I will tell you, one of the greatest transformation, the greatest miracle that you can expect when the presence of God is with you is that you will talk differently. You will stop saying negative things. You will stop saying useless, unworthy words. And you will start speaking according to the truth of God. In the book of James, uh, James said that the tongue is the most evil and vile of things. And that the tongue itself would be sent to hell and burn in hellfire. That's pretty harsh uh, for anything, you know. And I, I want to tell you this because I thought it was... Uh, pretty significant when I heard it. There was a pastor preaching, and he said that I have a very uh, evil, sinful part of my body. Do you want to see it? Let me show it to you. And then he stuck out his tongue. Um, and it is. It's true. Um, the Bible tells us that our tongue, nothing, no one can tame. And it is the, it is the thing that shapes your lives, and we don't know it. So if you speak, whatever you speak, if it's full of faith and what God says about you, that is the life that you receive and that is the life that you live. If you speak full of worthless words and negativity, that is the life that you receive and that is the life that you live because God treats us according to our word. And nothing and nobody can tame the tongue except God himself. But he will not tame our tongue unless you yield our tongues to him. In our, in, in our words to him. He's not going to uh, do what he did to Zechariah um, and just silence us. Um, because Zechariah, I told you, uh, the angel uh, silenced him for another reason. Uh, next week, we'll, uh, we'll learn more about that. But I just want you to understand that sometimes miracles, don't think, uh, we don't think it is what it is. But the changing of your mouth and the way that you speak is the greatest miracle of a transformed life is the evidence of God in your life. And so I just don't want to talk about it. I want us to do something about it. So those of you, uh, well, actually, everyone close your eyes. And those of you who want to submit your tongue, who want to transform your speech and, though, uh, and so doing transform your life, repeat after me. We're going to just say a simple prayer to ask God to help us uh, control our, our tongue. So you don't have to say it loud, just loud enough for you and God to hear. Jesus Christ, I submit my tongue and my words to you. From this day forth, Holy Spirit, help me to speak worthy words and not worthless words. In the name of Jesus, amen. And those of you who have done that, I would recommend you do it each and every day. I would recommend you do it like for three months and you will see a change in your life. That's exactly what I experienced. I found a Bible verse in the Old Testament that says something like that. Uh, it says, uh, God, you have restored me and forgiven, uh, forgiven me. Um, I speak worthy words and not worthless words and you will turn the people's hearts towards me. I didn't know what it really meant, but I liked it. Uh, so I kept praying that each and every day, and just like the verses say, my life was transformed because my words were transformed. So that is a miracle that you can experience right now because you live in the time of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit is with you. And then the second miracle, short, sweet, and simple, was obviously um, after they left, um, Elizabeth got pregnant, and uh, let me tell you about pregnancy in old people. So when I was 38, I was pregnant with Mendak, and um, he was my number five. And you wouldn't imagine, they said that I am like an older mother. So they subjected me to all kinds of extra tests. And uh, I had to go visit the doctor like twice as often as the younger mothers in the, uh, you know, 20s and early 30s. And that was only 38. Imagine Elizabeth, she was well over 60. And uh, let me tell you how great this miracle is. There has been no other person in the, all of the Bible 
uh, that was pregnant beyond 60 years of age, except who? Sarah. Sarah. Good. And so this is like a miracle of Abrahamic proportion. Sarah and Abraham had a baby when they were 100 years old. This is that big. And it happened to Zechariah and Elizabeth. And so I want you to understand that the time that we live in is the time of Jesus Christ, the time that the Holy Spirit is poured out on us. And this is something else I learned too recently that I want to encourage you. Some people ask God for a specific gift, like a gift of healing, like a gift of um, prophecy. Um, but I tell you that we have the Holy Spirit. We have all the gifts of the Spirit. That's the time that we live in. The kingdom of God is within us. And so everyone, please stand up. I want us to view our life in the presence of God after Jesus Christ was born as the reality that God has made possible for us. We live in the time of God's presence, in the time of God's power manifested, shown out, displayed on this earth over all the powers of darkness. And we should start believing like that and acting like that and praying uh, according to the times that we live in after the birth of Jesus Christ. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, God, God, we thank you for this time that we have together, God. And we thank you for um, all the miracles that you have shown us, God. And you yourself, Jesus Christ, say that we will lay hands on the sick, we will cast out demons, um, and we will speak in new tongues, God. All these things that you have promised to every believer, God, the time is now. And it's uh, for us and for all those who believe in our children, our children's children, God. God, we thank you so much, Jesus Christ, for transforming this world, God, and bringing your kingdom to, to earth, God. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you engage every person's heart and mind here so that we would put our hands to the work of the kingdom, God, so that we will speak um, your will, God, and we will do your will. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. I love you, Lord, and I and forgiveness of Jesus Christ and the unity of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of us until we see you face to face. Amen. All right. Um, you junior high and high school kids, come uh, help serve the food.